How did this bike become this? Stay tuned and you will learn how. Welcome to my bike restoration channel. Uh, with this being my first full restoration video, I need to provide a little background. My name is Brian and I have been fixing bikes since I was a kid, but only in 2014 did I decide to build my first bike from the frame up, which I ride to this day. I became hooked on building bikes and started branching out into bike repairs, uh, looking to buy older or broken bikes with the intent to repair and flip them for a small profit. As I grew more accustomed and experienced in bike building and repair, I began looking for older and vintage bikes as they are actually more of a challenge to fix due to the unavailability of parts. This forces me to be resourceful in the usage of parts and to find innovative, innovative solutions to problems I encounter. And I hope to be able to share those with you through this channel. I formed One Loose Sprocket more as a whimsical name for my hobby, but it has stuck and I like the concept it provides because at times I wonder if I have a loose sprocket in my head. My restoration projects will be geared towards a budget in mind, striving to use all available parts as much as possible to reduce the material cost as my major goal. From there, I will be as thorough as, as possible in restoring, but I am not looking for a showroom quality. Simply bring, bring it back to a rideable, clean looking vehicle. So. To start with, we're looking at a 1988 Trek 360. Uh, it was built obviously back in the late 1980s and it has the six speed rear derailleur and sprocket. And it's a Suntour AccuShift brand all around. So all the components are either AccuShift or uh, you can see the Suntour there as well. Uh, but the Crank is a Sugino VL apparently. It's a little difficult to read there, but I believe that's what it says. Just want to confirm that. The chain is quite rusted as you can tell. And obviously the back hub has significant grime and junk on it. The wheels are spotted with paint or whatever it is. And the front hub does have a Maillard hub, which is French, French made. Uh, that's kind of nice that uh, they were they were a big that but they had their heyday back in the 80s There's the badge that we have um, We have of course a quill stem the typical brake Handlebars our brakes on the handlebars with the shifters on the down tube So nails are also all Suntour um, All Japanese made not Chinese and There's a few you know a few blemishes and some dick nicks and scratches and dings and things like that but nothing really really major um, obviously we have the diacomp brakes which are also part of the 5000 series and uh, the brake pads don't look too bad uh, also noticing they're obviously with the quill stem which is very typical of that era the saddle is a um, is also a little beat up, but we'll have to uh, investigate that a little later on. And um, the one thing, of course, that had gum wall tires in, in the past, I don't know how long ago that was, but it definitely was a long time ago because that the gum wall pierce, part of it is actually completely gone. And it looks like it's been in an accident because as I rotate the back wheel, then you can see there's significant play in the in the way the the rim should be should travel so it's it's definitely seen better days and that is going to be definitely be a problem to to rectify so but overall again nothing really jumping out of me as major as as far as the equipment is concerned and obviously the you can see that the chain does have some play to it so again it is rusted but i don't think it's too bad rust obviously on the front the front derailleur as well 
but overall all the parts do seem to be look pretty good as with that time era uh, they did have the clip on pedals and um, those i will have to de decide what i want to do with those to clean them up and either clean them up completely remove the clip ons and just leave the pedals i don't know i'll, I'll decide it has a little bit of uh, stiffness in the the top sprocket here the um chain chain um chain guide and uh, the lower one seems to be okay i should say the lower one seems to be the one that's most that's most stuck the top one seems to be better but obviously there's already some it, it cracked the plastic here plastic plastic little little plastic uh, decorative piece there and there's still some looks like a little bit of the paint came off with with removing this but other, other than that it seems to be in pretty good condition just need a little bit of re restoration that's all Looks like somebody actually painted this one at one time because the paint is not sticking to the aluminum too well. So it's very possible this was painted. I think I might do the same thing. It's also a little bit crooked. The, um, you can see here how the, how it's a little bit on to one side. So probably because he wanted to be, the person wanted to have their bike pump here. So they had to go do it this way and it twisted sideways. Okay, so the basic teardown process is obviously to remove all the existing components. Now this would include uh, obviously the wheels, um, the crank, uh, seat posts, the uh, handlebars, uh, brake levers, brakes, front and rear derailers, the shift levers, stem, headset, fork, bottom bracket, cables, cable housing, bottom bracket, cable guide, and finally, the seat post retaining bolt. <laughs> I actually didn't record a whole lot of this and I will apologize, I'll have to do a little bit better job on the next time where I actually show the breakdown of me removing all the stuff, but hey, it's taking out a bunch of bolts and that's pretty much all it is. There's not a whole lot of science here. And I'm sure that you would ne definitely don't wanna sit there and watch me taking stuff off it's much more interesting to see me putting the stuff back on and how I get to that point. So obviously I did concentrate much more on this build with that in mind. But regardless, I will at least show how things are removed because obviously it's good for me as well to be able to see how things are removed because then I can say, oh yeah, this goes here and not make a mess of something and maybe put something on backwards and I probably have more discussion about that in the future. 
Okay, so once I have a naked frame, <laughs> a full cleaning is done. And what I use is as my standard go-to uh, solution is a mixture of mineral spirits and gasoline to remove dirt and residue. And then I follow up with a cleaning with isopropanol. Now I should mention that I do not use a half and half mixture with gas in there. It may be about a, a 60, 40 or even a, a 70, 30 mixture. It's, I don't use a whole lot of gas because the gas of course will chew up the plastic. I mean, it, it's, it's rather corrosive to, um, to certain paints, obviously things like that. So I do not use a lot of it, but it's really good at getting off the junk. It really does a good job. And of course, the isopropanol is very clean. It's, it, it, you know, alcohol is that's rubbing alcohol, basically. It's not used, it's not a, a, a da damaging thing, something like if you're to use something like acetone. So regardless, that's, that's what I have. So once I did that, I inspected it and looked at the, the blemishes, blemishes and the irregularities on the frame. Uh, looked for any dings, scratches, rust, of anything that I could see that might need some work. And since once I had a clean, I did notice that the frame actually looked really good. I mean, there it actually was not scratched up, didn't have major dents, there was no structural integrity issues, and really was just the task of removing the, you know, cleaning up the missing paint and, and the, the rust in certain spots. So I did isolate a few spots, as you can see here, uh, needing some repair. But the biggest, I think the biggest piece that I saw that was really requiring uh, the most work would be the top tube, which had quite a bit of rust underneath the um, the cable guide, uh, the cable guide housing, uh, sorry, the cable housing guides, and those are always um, difficult to work with. So that was one thing. Now. Um, the strangely enough, it actually still had the original gloss, which of course that was amazing and once once I actually got it cleaned up so that was really good so what I did then is I clear away the major areas with a Dremel tool and a sanding bit and then once I cleaned it the intent is to touch of course that area those areas with my touch of paint now I removed several active rust spots and some some places were actually just had paint chips that didn't quite make it through the primer and usually those I don't really care too much about. That's 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 again, it's it's nice to see some wear and tear on the bike because of course it is still considered a bike that's now what 30 over 30 years old. So I mean it's it's understandable there's going to have some problems on a map. Like I say, I'm not looking for showroom quality here. I'm not trying to bring this thing back to a pristine condition. I'm just bringing it back to say, look, now it looks like a decent bike. It works and is uh, definitely worth something worth riding around. That is the intention. So, <clears throat> what <clears throat> what I started to do then, as I started to send it out to the bare metal and the, with the intent to use some enamel paint that I, I used for some plastic model airplanes years back, and I was just going to use that. So, the issue is, of course, that the thickness of the original paint is more than what the touch of paint would have. There, it's not built up all the way to the level of which the original paint would be. So I think in the future, what I will do is actually use what the uh, auto restorers do. And a lot of, I pull a lot of my knowledge from auto restoring. And that would be to use Bondo, which is of course is either filler that you use to fill in um, uh, divots and, and dents and uh, things like that. Uh, especially for when you're doing your body work on a car, it's kind of the same concept as a bike. That's why it's, it's the, you know, the, these concepts do translate pretty easily to, uh, to a bike. So uh, the biggest issue was not having the original color. So I did take a, a yellow that was a lighter color, added some blue paint to it with the intent to try to get it to the color that I wanted. And I was under the impression that when I did this, then that I would, the, the color would darken when, once it dried. And apparently it does not. So it's pretty obvious that this color is not the original color. If you can tell where I touched up. But again, it's better than seeing the rust. It's better than, than seeing, and, and again, it will protect the frame from additional rusting, which really is, of course, that's a key feature of what we're doing here. Uh, I sanded this down after a couple passes to with a, a, a thousand grit sandpaper, and then once I had it kind of cleaned up and, and more or less flat, then I just went ahead and painted over it with the clear coat to protect the paint itself. 
uh, without um, undue obsession to the details, I opted to let the paint go and I just said, uh, let me concentrate more on the mechanical requirements. So the first thing I did was as I start my now rebuild and reassembly was to attach the fork back on the frame and uh, I cleaned and lubricated the headset and I reattached the fork and also did the same process of course because I wanted to make sure that I had the same overall you know approach to the fork because of course it has the same paint job as the as the frame so definitely wanted to use that I had to make sure to do that and of course attaching it was much easier than having me try to hold the fork uh, separate it just put it back on the bike itself and just work from there but I did actually re-grease re the, the bearings and you know re just basically cleaned up the headset and reattached the, the cups and things like that so that, that's pretty much what I did. There was actually some discoloration of the fork due to the bike computer that had probably been on there for I don't know how many years I have no idea. It just obviously you could see where the go there was some ghosting that was being uh, probably due to the sunlight and uh, where the the wire came down to the the, the uh, front wheel and to because of usually you have a magnet on there for the for your speedometer etc. Et and obviously I, I I couldn't do anything. I I, try I looked at it cleaned. Down. I was like, well, do I what do I want to do here? And again, just in the in the the essence of not trying to make the showroom quality. I just, you know what, let it go. It's it's one of those things I just have to accept it. It's ingrained in the, you know, the discoloration of the of the paint itself. I, I'd have to strip it down to the paint, repaint it with a paint that I don't have. I mean, I could have I could have actually painted it a different color and given it a, here I am, I'm trying to restore. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to look for the showroom quality. So therefore I said, I decided, to let it go and say, okay, it's, it's just going to be something that the bike is going to have to carry with it. Uh, after that, I started working on the bottom bracket and the bottom brackets are the old solid steel square taper axle. They're quite heavy, obviously, but very practically indestructible. And I love working with them and because they are so easy to service. I do have a little bit of a beef with the biking industry because they started coming out with these sealed bottom brackets, which are basically have sealed bearings. And according to them, it was to help and, uh, you know, to, to protect you from all the dirt and grime that's going to get into your bottom bracket, your bearings and blah, blah, blah. I have had more problems with those types of sealed bottom brackets than I have ever had with the the standard old square taper uh, axles. And the reason why is because of course, because you can't service them. They are unserviceable. So the crank was actually really nice to service. Uh, the teeth were clean and weren't bent or broken. Uh, the overall condition of the chain rings were similar to the rest of the bike. Um, they were straight and they didn't appear to be crooked. Uh, I did have to leave the wear marks on the crank arms because um, they were, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to reproduce that paint or anything like that. It's, it's a minor detail, but again, it, you, you do see it. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's kind of aesthetically, it's kind of bothersome. Um, I did remove the retaining bolts and nuts, uh, cleaned each one of the chain rings separately, um, polished up the nuts and the bolts because they were a little rusted. But again, since these are for the most part, uh, chrome, co chrome coated, then they are it's they they do chrome i love working with chrome because it is it is a very good um a retardant to rust and as well as you can get the rust off of it if it does rust you can get the rust off of it without damaging the the chrome too badly so after you know polishing up the nuts and bolts and reassembling the crank uh, I w was able to put it back on the on the spindle uh, of the bottom bracket and confirm that the rotation was good. There was a slight uh, deviation as I rotated the crank. I noticed it a little bit later on once I had uh, the the chain on there because uh, I could see that it was it was it was touching the the front derailleur after a little while. But again, we will uh, we'll I'll have to uh, we'll review that in a little bit.
The rear derailleur uh, was definitely dirty, uh, had significant caking and grime found in various places. Obviously the two pulleys that are used, uh, that's always a big thing. People think that they need to put as much grease as they possibly can on the chain. It is not necessary. Uh, without getting into too much discussion about chain maintenance, I'll deal with that in another video. But the more grease you put on there, the more it attracts dirt and it collects the dirt and the dirt gets into the pulleys, it gets into the gearing, it gets into the, uh, the sprocket, it gets, it's, it's stuck on the, on the chain, it's, the chain itself obviously uh, messes up the, the, the crank and really just a mess. And plus of course it gets on you because if you ever touch it, then of course it's now you've got a, what they call a bike tattoo, if you, especially if, it's, if you touch it with your leg then you've got this nice uh, crank look on your on your leg and that is a bike tattoo and that is never fun, especially if you're wearing pants. Okay, so regardless, that was something that I noticed. So I um, I took off the, the guide on the back of the pulleys, took off the pulleys, uh, removed them, uh, cleaned them up, just put a little bit of grease in there. Obviously, it's good to keep them greased up, especially for those, those bushings. Those bushings do require some grease in there. Um, just basically just soaked them away with obviously with, with mineral spirits. Uh, I like to polish the aluminum with my, of course, my quadruple odd uh, fine steel wool. And even though, and I should say, and this is obviously from experience, that even though mineral spirits are not considered hazardous for, for the most part, it can be absorbed into the skin and can cause a tingling sensation. And I'm sure that's a very uncomfortable feeling for most people as with me. So I would recommend using some nitrile gloves to protect the hands. Um, do not use the old latex gloves. They've actually gotten away from them a lot. I do have some latex gloves, but I use them more for dry work where I just want to keep my hands from getting dirty uh, because I like that they're a little bit more supple and they, they kind of they conform to the fingers easily if I'm working with something but the nitro gloves are actually much more resistant to uh, solvents and things like that. And so therefore I would say do that as well as when you're working with any type of solvent or something that is volatile, you want to do that in a ventilated area so that it doesn't accumulate. You can get lightheaded after some time and potentially depending on what it is you're using, uh, something that is uh, highly volatile like acetone can be uh, dangerous, obviously detrimental to your health. And of course, I'm, I'm not trying to say this as a, I'm just saying this as a public service, not necessarily because I'm trying to protect myself against uh, potential, uh, <laughs> any, any liability. This is it just simply means, you know, hey, I've, I've learned this over the years and I try to be a little bit careful. I do work in my garage, obviously, and I don't have a whole lot of space. So that is something that I'd be careful with. But regardless, it's still, I do raise my, I do, I lift up my, my garage door many times when I'm working on stuff and allow you know the breeze to come through and protect myself okay so now uh let's talk about the chain obviously the chain was a fun project or a fun part of this project i should say and although it was quite rusted again i did see it it did seem to be the the links seemed to be working well uh the bushings inside the each one of the links seemed to be all right I did have a few that were somewhat stiff and I was like, you know what, is this really something that I, that I need to, uh, I, I just need to clean those up. I'm just going to get, just working back and forth with a couple of pliers and stuff like that. And after a while, they, they kind of loosen up pretty easily. Again, it was much more the time that is spent rusting and if it's too much time, then uh, I just said, I tossed the chain because it's, it's not worth the effort to try to clean those up. Because this one did look pretty good, I was like, you know what, let me give this a shot. Let's see what happens. If it does come through, fantastic. If it doesn't, forget it. I'm not gonna bother trying to salvage something that's unsalvageable. Uh, you know, what, at this point I said, I said, well, let's, let's start soaking it. You know, let's get this thing to the point where we can start to, you know, see what, what's going on here. And of course, the, usually the first thing I do is start working out the, the majority of the rust as much as I can um, between using some steel wool. I don't like using steel wool, wool too much on a chain because it does get, it, get, it catches on the links themselves. But a steel, uh, st a wire brush, a steel wire brush is actually really good. 
Uh, we can get down in more of the nooks and crannies and things like that of where the chain is. So I did do that. The other thing I did, I said, I said well, let me give it a shot. And I'm, I put it, I put it in some uh, a rust inhibitor, a rust, or sorry, it's basically a, a rust cleaner. And a rust remover solution is what it's, what it's typically called, I think. And I put it in there. I've, I've, I've had marginal success with that in the past. And this time I gave it a shot just to see what happened. And I, the reason why I don't like using it too much is because it does turn the metal black. Uh, you know, it, it, it'll turn the steel black. And I, I didn't really want that. I really wanted to keep the natural color of, this, of the steel. So I went back to my wire brush and alternated between using a, a hand wire brush and a Dremel tool with the wire brush attachment and for some of the hard to reach spots that I had there. <clears throat> After working on this thing for a good two to three hours or longer, I lose track of time. After a while, I just start doing this and I just I get down into just doing the, the task. Um, I did clean it to the point where I was satisfied with the results. Now, as a, as a, I added it to to the bike. I did say, okay, once I have it in, installed on the bike itself, then of course now it's held in, in position. I, can, I have an extra hand I can work with instead of trying to work with one. I can then kind of work them and, and, and work into the, the different uh, bushings and stuff like that. So that's how I was able to get off. It's just a final inspection as well, just to kind of clean up any of the ones. And as I use my Dremel tool, then of course with the rotation of the uh, wire brush attachment, it actually will spin the, the the bushings and they actually then I could clean them all the way through around the only part that I cannot really get too well is the inside walls of each one of the links themselves because of course that's I need something to, and I finally said you know what I'm gonna try to use a I use I, I got a um, an airbrush cleaner and it has all these all these different diameter of, of nylon uh, nylon brushes so I used one of those and just kind of just went after some of the insides and got some more of the junk out. I mean, again, what I want to do is just try to get as much off, much off. And then again, I gave it a final cleaning with some mineral spirits to kind of wash away any of the excess stuff there. Once that was done, then I, I applied a, a dry lube, they call it. And it's basically, it's basically made by DuPont. Well, the stuff that I use was made by DuPont. It's uh, it's just it's a, they call it a dry lube, a dry chain lube, and it's uh, it's designed for locations where you don't get too much rain, as well as the reason why I like it is because it will actually uh, not attract dirt as much, and it's kind of a, it's it's almost like saying wax base. That's what it is really. It's, it just does have Teflon in there, so therefore Dupont can make their claim to fame, but for the most part, it's a wax based lubricant. And the reason why I like that is, first of all, it does not stick. It's, it doesn't. It doesn't clog, and and cake on like uh, a, a like grease will, as well as because it's a dry lube. Then of course it doesn't attract dirt as much. So I typically like that. And of course, then if you touch it with your arm, leg, whatever, it doesn't leave as much of a tattoo either. <laughs> That's a road of interesting uh, benefits that you can have from using a dry lube. Okay, so now I started in on the front derailleur, and uh, obviously the front derailleur is not a, it was not a big deal. It, it just had rust on the inside of the chain guide, and uh, that can be difficult to touch, but at the most part, again, it was just dirty, just cleaned up as much as I could, and it was a little stiff around, you know, because of the joints were, had not been used too much, obviously, it's probably been sitting there for uh, some time. So again, exercising it a little bit, you know, expanding and, and having it contract and cleaning up the, the spring on the, the internal spring it has there was for the most part, the standard stuff. Again, just soaking it in the mineral spirits, you know, going after with the wire, uh, wire brush, you know, the nylon wire brush, I think is what I used on this one. And then of course, polishing some of the, some of the aluminum with my fine steel wool. And for the most part, that's all I needed to do. So I was like, hey, great, okay, so I'm done with my, my front derailleur, let me go put on the bike. And I said, like, well, now I have to take off the chain to put the derailleur on. And then I realized that it did have a retaining screw for the chain guide. So by taking out the screw, I was able to open up just a little bit to slide it over the chain, put the screw back on, attach the front derailleur on the C-post, or sorry, on the C-tube, 
and uh, therefore I did not have to take the chain back off. I was uh, <laughs> that was definitely a benefit for me there. So nice. So then I started in on the handlebar and the stem and was able to clean the stem and the handlebars from the old, I st really took off the, the old handlebar tape and the adhesive that was used for that handlebar tape. Uh, it appeared that the tape had been there for quite some time. I don't think it appeared, to, it didn't appear to be the original, but it had definitely been there for several years and had disintegrated with time and was a little bit a little bit of frustration to remove. I mean, obviously it's just kind of what it was. It wasn't too bad. I just, of course, used my gasoline, gas, gasoline mixture. The gas, it works great for things like that. That's why I, I created that kind of a, that little concoction for my cleaning method and uh, got most of the stuff off. Uh, the stem was fantastic. I mean, it just, it just cleaned it up, just polished a little bit with uh, some of my steel wool and put it right back on the, on the, on the fork. So it was really easy to do. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the wheels. Uh, and this was the fun part, is I had a huge problem trying to fix them. I spent hours of trying to fix this thing. So let me describe what happened. In order to get started, I actually removed the skewer and the free wheel. I removed the spoke protector and then I started to take the wheel off I mean this the gummo with tire was obviously very shot um, there was no way I was going to ever hope to use it again but as you can see I tried to for the most part take it off with my hands and not use the the tire lever too much because I would prefer to salvage the tube if possible so once that was off then I was able to see that the rim tape was completely gone as well and even to the point that they had glued it on originally and I had to kind of clean off some of the debris and the junk that was kind of accumulated on the inside of the rim and had <laughs> had quite a good uh, interesting time trying to to fix that I finally was able to get some isopropanol and with that uh, it took off the majority of it I didn't get down into all the uh, crevices and cracks, so I figured I'd just look at that a little later on. From there, I started to bang on that seam to try to see if I can straighten that up using my adjustable wrench to kind of bend the walls of the rim out. And then once I did a little bit, I thought it was better, so I started looking at removing the, the spokes and the spoke nipples and basically just separating everything out. So I, the first thing I do is get, use some steel wool on the spokes and just go ahead and clean them up, get the junk that's off there. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, just a little bit of combination of reception. It looked like some, some paint had been, been sprayed on it somehow, some overspray or something like that had been got, gotten on the bike itself in general. And it, the spokes obviously had some of that. Uh, just, you know, grease, oil, and uh, some abrasions there were there uh, that had happened. Uh, it, it looks like it, it again, it, it, it had been in a in an accident apparently and had fallen, and something had scratched up one, some, a few of the, the spokes. And as I was mentioning before about the shorter spokes, the shorter spokes go on the drive side, which is the side that has the sprocket because you want to give yourself a little bit more room for your gears then the non-drive side, which is the opposite side, which would be the standard. If, if you said, if, you, if this were like a front wheel, the front wheel, I mean, for the most part, they have exactly the same spokes on both sides. The links are the same because you want the wheel centered. That has changed with newer technology because now that you have something like a, 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 a brake, uh, a rotor brake, uh, which of course a disc brake will require some space there. So the front, even the front wheels now would be probably somewhat offset and require two different lengths of spokes 
for the most part, that's not necessarily a, a big deal. But again, in this in this case, I'd forgotten about that. And I, as I was starting to put it together, I noticed my nipples, some of them were really long, some really short on the spokes. I was like, oh, that's right. So I took them apart, separated them out, uh, made sure that I had the right spoke lengths on for, for each side, and then went ahead and put it back together. So again, struggle a little bit with getting the truing correct, uh, being able to get it set up the way I liked it, but I did finally get it to a point where it was more or less true, except for the one spot very near the seam, and then it made more sense why the seam was offset, it's because someone it had been impacted somewhere really close within the, a few inches of that, and that was why, part of the reason why it was, it was so bad. So uh, for the rear wheel, I used a rock tumbler to polish the, the spoke nipples. And um, when I did this, I did put some I did put some fine grit in there just to kind of help the process, kind of get the junk off there. I thought, yeah, usually I use straight water and I don't do anything else. But this time I said, well, this, you know, to kind of speed up the process, I just do this in there. Unfortunately, I walked away and when I came back a couple hours later, it had stripped off the chrome <laughs> off the brass nipple. So <laughs> Oh, like, whoops. Oh, sorry about that. Well, that's that's a bit of a problem. So luckily, again, spoke nipples are not expensive. I did have some new ones, so I just went ahead and used the, the, new, the, the new nipples. So it was not a big deal. So I started putting it back together, and once I started to reassemble it, I forgot that I had two spoke links. And dummy, I had to take the whole wheel back. I take it, had to take it apart. And of course, the time-consuming portion of a bike build is the spoke lacing. You have to know exactly where you're putting stuff before you just kind of, you can't just slap it together. You have to know exactly what's happening. The the rim, if you look at the, the rim, they some of them uh, sometimes will be, will be offset so that the spokes actually go through an offset hole or they sometimes will be in, in, line, in line with with each other, which of course doesn't make any difference. But also, if you look at the hub, then the spoke holes are not centered. They are actually, they're not uh, directly opposite each other. They are offset because it is assumed that you're going to be connecting it to different holes on, and of course it's gonna be offset as well for the spokes themselves going to uh, the different spoke holes in the rim. So you, you have to make sure that those line up really good. And again, I will be just I will be doing another video on this thing on how to build a wheel. So it, 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 I'll go in much more detail, but just making sure that you understand that that's the case. So I went ahead and trued up the wheel as best I possibly could after a significant amount of effort. And the best I could do was to have that slight deviation caused by the impact and I didn't want to overstress the spokes too much, so I was going to let this go. I figured that was enough. I went ahead then and installed the rim tape, putting rim tape on there to help obviously protect the, the tube from, even though this was a double walled rim, uh, the rim tape, high pressure rim tape is a highly suggested because it does protect those burrs and possible you know, openings for the, the, the spoke nipples from causing any, you know, from cutting into the, the tube or anything like that. So that's obviously a, a good thing, especially with the high pressure tubes that are used with most road bikes. Once I got the skewer all greased up, I went ahead and installed that. And then from there, went ahead and cleaned up the sprocket and installed the sprocket. Then I moved on to the front wheel. And in order for me to learn from my previous mistakes, I went ahead and removed the, the spoke nipples and the spokes, obviously, from the, the, the wheel. And this time, I went ahead and I spent more time on I'm making sure that I had everything off and then went ahead and put those into the rock tumbler. This time did not add any medium to any abrasive medium to, to help remove stuff because it was <laughs> I knew it was gonna do a very good job by itself. So I went ahead and just added them as as is. And they came out much better, even though it's a little hard to tell when you see the um, 
from the picture it's a little bit um, it looks like they're all yellow being the, the all the finish came off of them but that is not the case they actually turned out pretty good they were they were a little bit worn obviously just because of age but enough that I didn't have to worry too much about them so at that point I moved on to the hub and began cleaning it obviously removing the ball bearings and making sure I could clean out the, the bearing races, clean up the the axle and the, the cone the cone nuts and the, all that stuff. And I went ahead and, and put everything back together, as is typical with a uh, a rebuild of the hub. Just made sure that everything was in the right place. And then I went ahead and cinched it up and made sure that it was adjusted correctly, it was spinning smoothly. And I then added or started working on the, the skewer itself and cleaning the lever and just taking off a little bit of the uh, surface rust that was there. Again, it was, it, was an easy, it was an easy clean because again, there's just, it was, there was no real pitting going on. And my little handheld Dremel tool does a really great job of just removing that surface rust and making it shine, so it didn't, it wasn't as noticeable. And again, I just did not have much troubles at all. From there, I was able to assemble the, the wheel, and of course, it was straightforward. Once I had it assembled, I went ahead and just cleaned up some of the channel there inside the uh, the rim bead make sure all that excessive uh, dried and caked on adhesive from the rim tape had been removed and that was just clean on the inside pretty much. And of course, checking out the truing of the rim, it was very clean. I can see straight, I mean, just with the slightest variation, but I mean, so minor that was it's inconsequential with respect to the wheel itself. So I was very happy, put on the rim tape to kind of prep it a little bit and uh, put the skewer back on there and I thought this is awesome we're done let's put it on the bike then I had a second thoughts about the back tire back wheel I mean and I was like you know what I really don't like the way this is looking I'm gonna take this off again and see if I can just fix this the the rim seam and just completely destroyed the sidewall it you can see it's all crit it was all crooked uh, just the, uh, I was I was like oh I can't believe it I, I after all that work I just done so at that point the the rim was irreparable and there was nothing more I could do about it so I actually had a pair of newer rims that I just put next to the existing wheel and transferred everything over from the spokes to the spoke nipples and maintaining the pattern that I already created with the original. And uh, so basically, I almost went back to square one to an extent on building these wheels. Uh, but yeah, th th there was no way. I, I, had, I couldn't go look back at this point. I just went ahead and made the, the transfer. So moved everything over. You can see that I'm transferring over from the, the one rim in the, the one that you can see, even see it at the top of the rim, you can see where that, that part was all it split and just went ahead and just moved it over to the other one, just tr transferred over with no troubles. It wasn't that big of a deal. It just means I had to just go through the process of unscrewing every single spoke nipple, all 36 on one wheel, and move that over to the other one. Obviously, when I did the truing of the wheel, uh, it was perfect. I didn't have any problems at all. And then moved on to the front wheel. And as I was doing the front wheel, then uh, usually those are easier because of course I have symmetrical spokes and I'd already done the rear wheel just, you know, seconds before. So this was I said, a piece of cake, slap this thing together, get it on the, on the bike and move on to other stuff. Right, what I did was, of course, I sistered up the, the new rim and transferred it over. Everything was looking good. But as I was cinching up my spokes, I realized that they were longer and I suddenly realized that the I didn't have any problems with the first uh, with the first rim. It was the second one that the spokes were just a little bit longer than 
than I had anticipated because apparently the inside diameter of the wheel was somewhat smaller than just, I mean, by, by a millimeter or two, but it was smaller than the original rim. So I had to go in and find some new, find some other spokes and scrounged around in all my, my spokes and was able to find a, a set of DT Swiss spokes, which are definitely an upgrade to what was on the bike. And I was, I was like, great, well, at least that, that'll work. So then I went through the process of then taking out all the old spokes and transferring out those spokes, putting in the new spokes and, and doing the same thing of going to the new, obviously with the, with the new rim. It, it was, I already transferred over from the old rim. And uh, I just did it one side at a time, just to kind of keep the continuity of the lacing that I had. And once I had done that, then I got to the end of my spoke at addition and realized I had 37 spokes in my hand, which, so apparently something had happened and I figured what happened was I probably had kept one of the original spokes in my hand when I was transferring and it was in the mix there of all the other spokes and I didn't know which one it was. I looked for it, looked for it, tried to find it from the spoke head because the spoke head has a DT Swiss stamped on it and the other ones did not and I could not find it. I looked for it and looked for it and it was just not there. Well, it was there obviously, but I just couldn't see it. So what I did was I said, you know what? I'm not gonna worry too much about this right now. Let's just get this up onto the bike and then later on I'll, I'll deal with it, whatever. And because it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal, but it just the fact that it, it was there kind of bothered me. So got got it trued up, put it up on the bike, and lo and behold, there it was. I saw it. I, I was like, that's it. It was just a I don't know, it was a shift in the lighting that I saw a slight discoloration of the spoke because of probably different steel, and that was all it took for me to recognize which one it was. So I put a little bit of blue tape on there, blue painter's tape just to mark it for me and went ahead and did some other things and then came back later and took out that one spoke and replaced it with the correct DT Swiss spoke. So again, with all of that then and hours of struggling and stressing and trying to get this thing set up correctly, I was finally able to consider my wheels done. I don't feel bad about what I did because I do feel like in good conscience I should have replaced that rim from the beginning. I just, again, in, in what I try to do, I just try to salvage everything I possibly can. But once I did crack that side wall of the rim, then I knew that was that was irre irreparable. I knew I was not going to be able to fix this. So I had to just tr trash it, go to these new rims. They're going to be stronger anyway and will probably be more resistant to pretzeling. Uh, which is basically warping the the back wheel, which is exactly what happened the first time. In the in the in the guise of trying to to reduce weight, of course you lose your stability of the of the wheel. And these also these rims were just a slight, a little bit wider as well, and were able to provide a little will provide a little bit more stability when riding with uh, especially with these tires that I put on there, which were some 20 I think they're 28 C wheels. So that's that's the whole. That's the, this, this was the, the end of the chapter of the wheel restoration portion. I then moved on to the brake levers and as again, the finish on the actual levers themselves were a little scuffed up. There's not a whole lot I could do with that. Just clean it on the inside, take out a little of the rust and just make sure that all the parts, the moving parts were in good working order and I apologize for the somewhat blurry picture. It is more focused on the table than it is on what I'm doing in my hand. So it is a, it's a blurry foreground. But uh, regardless, it didn't take too long for me to take those and, and clean them up. And after that, I moved on to the pedals. And this was a little more interesting because the pedals were obviously clipped on and uh, the, the strap was aged and quite rusted on, on the actual clip itself. So I decided that I did not want to try to restore the actual clips themselves and opted rather just to remove the, the clips and, and concentrate more on 
the actual spindle, the inside, the internal workings of the pedal, made sure that they were working as expected, it polished up the outside, all the aluminum um, alloy pedal itself, and, and really just looked at it from that perspective. There was not too much damage to it, and it just simply was a matter of cleaning it up to the point where it was uh, restored. I mean, that's really what I was looking for. Then I started working on the shifter levers. And again, it was just a simple cleaning, making sure that there's no junk inside any of the moving parts, you know, any of the, the grease that had probably dried up over the years. Clean all that out and re-grease and clean that up. Same thing with the brakes themselves uh, clean them up and like I say just with a with a brush just gonna clean it up a nylon wear brush I just cleaned those up got off all the junk and there's a little bit of rust on a couple of the bolts because they were steel instead of stainless steel so I went ahead and cleaned those up with my Dremel tool and once those were to my liking and I could see that bolts were looking okay then I went ahead and started in on the assembly of the shift levers on the bike itself. Um, again, greasing moving parts or, or threaded parts to make sure that they would uh, seat correct correctly, but at the same time be able to be removed if necessary in the future, We're not letting them get too fouled up in the future. That was the purpose of that. And then from there, I just checked to make sure my tension was good on the, the shift level levers and then went ahead to install the front brake and put a little thread lock on the thread there to make sure they didn't come off the exact opposite of what I do with, with typical grease and once I tighten that up made sure that it was it was centered pretty much in the middle so that it would grab the the wheel correctly same thing with the back wheel went ahead and Thread lock that as well, put that on the back, centered it, tightened it down. Once I was happy with all of that and things were looking pretty good, then I went ahead and moved forward on the uh, on installing the pedals and just making sure that they were installed correctly, making sure not to cross thread them. Uh, obviously that's always a, a big deal left on the left right on the right you have to make sure that you put the right pedal on the right uh, on the right crank arm and once those things were were set pretty well and i was happy with the rotation i then went ahead and added the the cable guide for the the rear derailleur well the, both, both of the derailleurs for the rear derailleur and for the front derailleur so now that i have completed the basic install of all the components and included the shift cables, brake cables, handlebar tape, some of the other the cable housing, uh, some of the minor things that I didn't show on um, this video. Then I moved into actually adjusting the limits on the derailers and just making sure that they were lining up correctly with the highest and lowest gears on the on the sprocket and I just wanted to make sure that it was uh, tracking correctly uh, you have to line those up especially when you do a recent install then the the shift the, the derailleur cables do have a tendency to kind of since they're under tension most of the time they do they do start to uh, stretch and accommodate a little bit and so therefore I, it does take a couple a couple iterations and uh, passes and making sure that they are working correctly and lined up as, as, as it should be. From there I did the same thing uh, as I was doing the rear derailleur I was doing the same thing on the front derailleur and just keep making sure that there isn't too much chatter between the range of the rear sprocket as it goes from the lowest gear to the highest gear, the highest gear to the lowest gear. There was a little bit, but that's something that I can't really do too much about because that's just the range that the front derailleur can accept. And I just went ahead and tried to make sure it was as centered as possible in the chain guide.
congratulations for making it to the end of this video and uh, I would really appreciate a um, subscription, thumbs up, notifications, whatever you want to do and because of the fact that you made it to the end of this video then I am willing to actually select one of my subscribers who leaves a positive comment to this video and I will actually give this bike to that subscriber as a, a gift of appreciation. So hopefully that will provide some incentive as well as allow others to, to see what, uh, what kind of work that I do and obviously I will be doing other bikes and other projects on the way and will hopefully be able to provide those as well to help promote uh, cycling and to get people out on the road and enjoy these great machines that even though they may be what we would consider maybe a classic they are just as valuable and just as viable as a as a, an exercise and as a form of recreation as anything else that you had out there so until the next video thanks a lot and good luck